So for gases, we have the ideal gas law. And I think you guys have seen this in chemistry, if you've taken chemistry. So there's the chemist version, which is this. So the pressure of the gas times the volume equals the number of moles of the gas times the gas constant times the temperature. So the one for physics looks similar bit different. So the left side is still the same, but now the right side N is the number of atoms or molecules of the gas. K is the Boltzmann factor, so it's just a constant. that I do not remember, we'll do that on the next slide. And then T is still the temperature. And so these things work for different cases. So you might do the chemistry one if you're mixing a lot of a diff two different chemicals together or two different gases, because then you can look at the number of moles of a gas. But for physics, we, if we are, if you're doing things, if you're doing things and with a lot of atoms or molecules, I guess maybe let's do that. Okay, so in physics, we define or we divide up how we do what type of physics we use by how many particles we have. So if we have a lot of particles, then we would be doing statistical mechanics. Mechanics, or we might just defer to what people are doing in chemistry. But if we have a few, few particles, then we're going to do thermodynamics. And so those two different equations that we looked at, if we have a lot of particles, then we might use the PV equals NRT equation. But if we have a few particles, then we might do the NKT equation. Yes. That's a good question. Uh, so that's kind of an open area of research, but typically a few particles we'll be talking about like less than 100, but then a lot of particles we're talking about millions to billions and, and greater. And maybe just more than millions. So you might notice that there's a gap between 
100 and millions. So that's an open area of research in physics where you can't necessarily just apply one set of rules and it's not clear what that crossover is. There's, and it's not, it's not a well-defined crossover for when I can use thermodynamics or when I have to use statistical mechanics. But you won't have to make any of those kind of distinctions in this class. Okay. So we've got these two different equations and they're only different in these two terms. Uh, but these are the same equations, so those two terms uh, have to be equal to each other, and they are. So, so from the chemistry version and the physics version, So R, which was the gas constant, is the Avogadro's number times the Boltzmann constant. And so let's look up what these constants are. Do you guys know what they are off the top of your head? There's no chemistry people here. So this is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And then Boltzmann constant. is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 meters squared kilogram per second per Kelvin. Second squared. And so that would make the gas constant I guess it would depend on what units you want to use, but Point three one, and then the units for this are going to be joules per Kelvin per mole. Because this is the number of atoms per mole. And a mole is just some amount of atoms. So this Avogadro's number is kind of weird because number of atoms is not really a unit and moles is kind of a unit, but it's not like, it's more just a measure of how many things there are. So, yep.
a subscript where next to the capital A or the cap here. Is that what you're? Uh, that's a lowercase a. So just to differentiate between the n that's over here and Avogadro's number. as they are different. So if we take this chemistry definition and we replace R with number of uh, Avogadro's number times Boltzmann constant. So this is another form of the ideal gas law that you might see. So all the things with stars are equivalent. And then if you take N, lowercase n times Avogadro's number, then you just get the number of atoms that are present. And so depending on the way the problem is written, they might give you lowercase n and r, so you would use the chemistry equation. They might give you uh, the number of atoms and that's it. And so you would know to use the Boltzmann constant uh, problem, or they might give you just the I guess if they gave you lowercase n, then you could use either of these two. And it would just depend on whether you knew what the gas constant was, or what if you knew what Avogadro's number and the Boltzmann constant are. But so the, the takeaway is that you can use any of these three equations. Yep. Yep. And so let's look at this equation conceptually now. So we'll use our physics definition. So if, so at constant temperature, the right-hand side is constant. So assuming you're not putting more particles into your system, like say it's a closed system. So let's say in a closed system. At constant temperature, then the right side is constant. So if I increase the pressure, so if pressure goes up, then the volume has to go down because the right-hand side was constant. Or if I decrease the pressure, then the volume would have to increase. Or vice versa, if I increase the volume, then I'm decreasing the pressure of my gas. Or if I decrease the volume, then I increase the pressure of the gas. So 
but temperature is not the only thing that we could keep constant. So instead we could keep the volume constant. So I guess all of these are gonna be closed systems for now. And these conceptual things that we're talking about. So at constant volume, so I put some amount or I put some gas into a set size of container. Now, if I increase the pressure, what will that do to the temperature of the gas? So if I increase the left-hand side of this equation, what will happen to the right-hand side? Right. So if I increase the pressure, the temperature goes up. What about uh, if I decrease the pressure? what will happen, right? Or if I increase the temperature inside my container, then I will increase the pressure. Or if I decrease the temperature, then I will decrease the pressure. Okay, and then the last thing you could do at constant pressure Let's do temperature first. So if I increase the temperature, what's going to happen to the volume? Yep. And then if I decrease the temperature, then the volume would decrease. So you have to pay attention to what the problem says is being kept constant and also uh, which two variables are you're looking at. And so this was all in a closed system, which meant that the there's no change in the number of particles. But there are tons of systems you could think of where we do change the number of particles. So what if you're filling a balloon up with air? So you're adding more particles to the balloon. So uh, then you have a different interplay between pressure, volume, and temperature. Okay. So the new equation that we're going to write is Pressure times volume equals one third N M V average squared. So the bar over the over anything, but in this case over the velocity means average. So if you see a straight line over something, it usually means that it's the average. Then this is mass. This is still number of molecules or atoms. And then this is still pressure and volume. So if we're comparing this equation to this physics equation that we had, 
then everything is the same except for this, the physics equation has a KT and then this uh, velocity equation has one third mv average squared. And so these two things are equal to each other. So we said that temperature is related to the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a gas. So if you wanted to solve for temperature as a function of the average velocity, it would look like this. Mv average squared over 3k. Yes. And the red box equation. So, right, so if we, the left hand side of both equations is just PV, right? So if I said PV equals PV, then on the left, I could put one third and MV average squared. And on the right, I could put NKT. And then because the capital N is on both sides, that would go away. And then I just get the equation that I have in the box. Yes. Capital T is the temperature. So we could also move that one third to the other side and then our equation would look like this. And the average squared equals three K T. So does the left side of the equation look like something that we've seen before? You know, what does it look like? Yeah, what is one half mv squared? Right, so one half mv squared is kinetic energy. So if we divide both sides by two, then we have this term looks like kinetic energy. And because this is a an average, you would write kinetic energy with a bar over the top. And so now we have another equation for kinetic energy. So if I told you the temperature of this room, which is probably like 60 degrees because it's way too cold, you could take that, I guess, 60 Fahrenheit, you could convert that to Kelvin and then multiply by three halves times the Boltzmann constant. And you would know the average velocity of the air molecules in this room. Okay, so now we have three different equations that are all the ideal gas law, and they're going to be, you would use them each depending on what kind of variables are given to you in the problem. So let's work with a couple of example problems. And I'll write down these gas laws.
ったんですよ。So let's say you are filling a balloon. With a pump that provides a pressure of 10 pascals you want the balloon to be 0 0.2 meters cubed in volume How many molecules will be in the balloon? If the temperature is Three hundred and seventy cal or no two seventy. Which is about room temperature. So just like we did with our kinematics problem, we can go through the problem and see what all is given. So we're given the pressure, we're given the volume, and we're given the temperature. So which, and we want to know the number of molecules, which would be N. So which equation would we pick? One, two, or three? Two, right. So if we pick equation two, solving for N, pressure times volume over KT. Pressure is 10, volume is 0 0.2. The Boltzmann constant is something that I don't remember. One point three eight times 10 to the minus 23. And then the units that I gave you are all the standard units. So I don't need to worry about any conversions and this temperature is in Kelvin. So again, you don't have to worry about converting that. And so if you plug this in, you would imagine that you're gonna get a very big number because you're dividing by 10 to the minus 23. So 5.37 times 10 to the 20. And this would be atoms or molecules.
And then thinking back to chemistry, if you knew what capital N was and you wanted to know the number of moles, you would take N and divide it by Avogadro's number. So 5.37 times 10 to the 20 divided by something times 10 to the 23rd, I think. Six point oh two two times ten to the twenty third. Eight point nine times ten to the minus four moles. Yes. Avogadro, it's someone's name who came up with this number. Like I, I wouldn't ask you to do this kind of thing on a test, but it's gonna show up in chemistry and biology a lot. So the more exposure that you have to it, the better. And then another thing that we can ask for is, so given this temperature of 270 Kelvin, what is the average velocity of the molecules in the balloon? So we had that the average kinetic energy was equal to 3 kT, so 1 half mv average squared is 3 kT, or wait, oh, this should be 3 halves. So solving for V, move the M to the other side and then take the square root. So the mass of, let's see. I guess we can do a couple of different examples. So if we were doing just typical air like that we're breathing in, that's a lot of nitrogen, a bit of oxygen and stuff. So the average mass So we might have to do some conversion. So they're giving me M air as 28 point, I'll just call it 29 grams per mole. Uh, but luckily we already found the number of moles. So the total mass of the air would be 29 times 8.9 times 10 to the minus four. Okay. 
So about 0 0.26 grams. And we would want that in kilograms. So 2.6 times 10 to the minus four kilograms. So three times Boltzmann constant, which was 1.5. One point three eight times ten to the minus twenty three times two seventy over two point six times ten to the minus four. Six times ten to the minus nine meter per second. And so that might seem pretty small, and it is, but you have to remember that these are very small particles that are moving around. So a meter to something like an air molecule is a huge distance to be covering. Yes. Uh, this is 29.8 grams per mole. And it was just something I looked up online. Oh, 29 times. Uh, so we had found the number of moles previously. So I multiplied that 29 grams per mole times the number of moles to just get the grams. And then I converted that grams to kilograms. So we could also Instead of just filling our balloons with air, we could have filled it with helium. So the mass of one helium atom is 6 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So that's one helium. And we said that we had two, 5.37 times 10 to the 20 molecules. So take this, so that would make the total mass. What did I say? 5.37 times 10 to the 20. So multiplying those two things together. Three point five times ten to the minus six kilograms. And so now the velocity for the helium would be the same equation but now it's a different mass. And 
And so because the helium is less massive and it's in the denominator of our equation, that's going to make the average velocity be uh, bigger. So this is now 5.65 times 10 to the minus 8. meter per second. So those are just some of the examples of what we can do with the ideal gas law and the this relationship between kinetic energy and temperature. And then the last thing we're going to talk about today is, so we've been spending time talking about gases. We talked about fluids, which a lot of the time was just liquids. And then the whole first half of the class was talking about solids. Uh, so now we're going to talk about how those all all of those different states of matter can interact with each other. So this diagram that I'm making is called a phase diagram. And this one is going to be pressure on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis, but different phase diagrams can plot different things. So there was a question. Uh, so I multiplied the so this is the mass of one hydrogen, or one helium, sorry, one helium atom. And then I multiply by the total number of atoms that we found. And that's how I got the total mass of the gas in the balloon. So going back to our phase diagram, I'm going to draw some lines. And this is just kind of a, this is just an example. This is not necessarily what a phase diagram for all different elements will look like. So in this region, this element will be a solid. In this region, the element would be a liquid. And in this region, the element would be a gas. So a couple of things to notice. So there is a point here in red where you would expect solid the element to be some kind of either combination of solid, liquid, or gas, or in an unstable, unstable equilibrium where if I move, if I increase the temperature a little bit or decrease the pressure a little bit, then I'm going to undergo a phase transition. And so this point where all of these elements could coexist is called the, or all of these phases could coexist is called the triple point. So this is where solid, liquid, and gas phases coexist.
And then the other thing that we'll notice is that, let's say I am a solid at this pressure and then I don't change the pressure and I just increase the temperature, then I could transition from a solid into a liquid. Then if I was that liquid and let's say I don't increase the temperature and I just increase the, or uh, decrease the pressure, then I could become a gas or vice versa, right? I could start over here as a gas, decrease my pressure or decrease my temperature and become a liquid. Or I could start over here as a liquid, increase my pressure and turn myself into a solid. So these are all phase transitions, these red arrows. And the ones that we just drew are the, the common ones that people know about. So solid to liquid, that would be freezing. Liquid to gas is boiling. Gas to liquid would be condensation. And then liquid, oh, I have this backwards. So solid to liquid would be melting. And then liquid to solid would be freezing. So you guys have, are all familiar with these phase transitions, right? So, but looking at this diagram, is it also possible to go from straight from a gas to a solid or vice versa, right? So does anyone know what those two transitions are called? Yeah. So solid to gas is sublimation. And what about the other one? So gas to solid is called deposition. And these phase transitions are pretty interesting. And if you, if we had more time in this class and we got into thermodynamics, we could talk more about it. Um, but you'll certainly see this in any kind of chemistry that you do. And, but the, a couple just interesting things that I can talk about. So uh, when you are doing these phase transitions, you will be putting in extra energy into the system. And typically, if you put energy into a system, you'll increase its temperature. But when an object is undergoing a phase transition, that increase in energy will not change the temperature of the whatever is doing its phase transition. And the temperature won't start increasing again until it's converted to that other phase. Um, and then uh, one of the other interesting things specifically about water is uh, most phase transitions, when you go from a liquid to a solid, you increase your density. Uh, but that does not happen for water. So for water, if you 
go from a liquid to a solid, you actually decrease the density. So that's why ice cubes float in your drinks. But for life on Earth, uh, it's very important. For example, if uh, ice didn't float, then when a, a lake or something froze over, the ice would all settle to the bottom and it would crush any thing living in the lake. Um, so that's, and you might think, well, that's just for stuff that lives in lakes, but there are hypotheses that at one point, uh, most of the earth was frozen. And so this could also happen in the ocean. So if you imagine all of the life in the oceans was just killed by the ice sinking to the bottom, then there would probably be no life on earth and we wouldn't be here talking about it. So uh, these, these kind of phase transitions are very important, just not just for learning about them in class, but they have very real applications to physics and biology and ecology beyond that.